check. Well, good morning, Venice Church. We have a few people trickling in on the fourth Sundays of the month. Our uh, Feed the Hungry team partners with Vinewood Church to go feed the hungry at Salvation Army. And so can we just give everyone that participated in that a round of applause? I mean, that's... Our mission is to make Jesus irresistible, in other words, to be the light and love of Jesus wherever we go in everyday life, and that's one big way that we do that um, as a church, and so thankful to Jackie and the whole team and everyone who showed up early, and thankful even for our partners. It's crazy that there's only a few churches that do that, and we're one of them, and so good job, Vintage Church, good job, Feed the Hungry. Um, I'm running around, so with my head chopped off a little bit, so I apologize. Um, wife's sick, couple kids are sick, and so just trying to manage it. Um, but whew, can we breathe? Whew. Jesus is good. Amen. We got a couple um, announcements that are in your bulletin. I want to go over those. And the first one is if you're new, just welcome. And uh, we have. Uh, some connect cards that you can fill out there in front of you in the pews. You can drop them off at our welcome kiosk or at our giving box, which is in the back of the sanctuary. And uh, we just love to connect with you. We send out a regular email, and if we ever are doing anything, um, that's the best way to know what's going on. Um, for, for some of you that may have children or grandchildren that may be interested, tomorrow night uh, we're having a parent-student meeting up in the youth room, and that's at 6.33, and we're going to have some Little Caesars pizza and just talk about the fall calendar. And so i um, excited about that and, and some of the opportunities to invite friends. And I know our kids have been talking about inviting their friends, and we have some neighbor kids, and there's some other families that are interested. And so even if you're just wanting to come check it out, you're welcome to come. But we're going to be having that meeting at 6.33 up in the fellowship room. And then also, um, after Labor Day, um, we're going to be starting up our gospel communities. And this fall, we're going to be doing something in our gospel communities called Alpha. Maybe you've seen that in Facebook or in one of the emails that I sent out. But Alpha is a, an environment where you can come and bring your non-Christian or your seeking friends or those that are maybe newer to the church. And they can ask questions in a safe environment where um, there's going to be food, there's going to be discussion, and then there's going to be a short video. And the hope is, is that through the end of the process that they have explored Jesus, made some relationships, built some community, and then built into Alpha is a day away or sometimes weekend away, depending upon the context and the people that are in the group. But it's at that weekend away or at that day-long thing where you talk about the Holy Spirit and you pray for people with the hope that they'd meet Jesus and experience his love. And some people do it several times. And um, But we're going to have a 10 to 15 minute after church before we jump into our fellowship time after church. And I'm just going to explain it a little bit more, answer any questions, and then kind of share with you um, how you might be able to participate. And so some of you are like, well, what is this? What are these videos like? And so this next two-minute video is going to give you kind of a taste for what Alpha is. And so I encourage you just to watch the screen behind me, and this will give you kind of a taste of what Alpha is. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I 
thing for so many years, you know, I always just strive to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, we'd be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. So um, Alpha is, I believe, an opportunity for us to invite people. We're going to be doing it in our stu student ministry as well. They do a youth version. And so I'm actually really excited. And the best way that you can participate with us is to pray. And so I encourage you to be praying. As we've been in this series on prodigal sons and prodigal prayers, I would encourage all of us to be praying for those lost sons and daughters, those sons and daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, neighbors, co-workers, nieces, nephews that are far from God. And potentially this might be an opportunity for them to explore uh, the faith. It talks about who is Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die? What is the Bible? What is prayer? How does God guide us? What's the meaning of life? And it's done really well, produced really well. And so I, I believe when we, we did a survey of a lot of our strengths as a church, we have a lot of hosts, people gifted in hospitality and help and service. And I think this presents a really great opportunity as for to serve our family and our neighborhood. And so with that, um, we have one other announcement. This Saturday, August 28th, um, we're having a craft fair in the fellowship room. Um, we are partnering with a local nonprofit called We Are One. They serve at-risk children and at-risk communities. And they're kind of like the middleman between the government and um, churches and nonprofits and community. And so we just happened to find them. They were looking for a place to host their craft fair. They have about 25 to 30 vendors coming um, this Saturday, all going to be in the fellowship room. And we're going to be hosting a snack uh, shack as the youth. And all the proceeds to that snack shack uh, will go to our relaunch of the student ministry. And so if you're not doing anything this Saturday, I encourage you to stop by. It's between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. in the fellowship hall and in the lobby outside of the kitchen and fellowship hall. And so one last announcement before we kind of transition is just our giving. Um, every Sunday, if you've come prepared to give, we give because God first gave us everything in Christ. And so if we give, we give always cheerfully and joyfully. Um, no pressure to give, but we do give in three ways at our church. You can give online, you can give via text, or you can give in the giving box at the back of the sanctuary. And we appreciate you supporting our mission here at Vintage Church. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Romans 8 as we kind of prepare ourselves to worship and to enter into this time of singing and celebrating and praying. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I've heard from a lot of people that they're tired, that they're afraid, they're unsure, they're just done. Does this relate with any of you? Whether it's Afghanistan or Haiti or the fires, every day we wake up and we see the smoke everywhere. And whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's cancer or sickness or tonsillitis. I mean, it's just one thing after the other. And it's burdensome. It's a lot. Um, whether it's on Facebook or elsewhere, you just see it in people. Um, we had our freezer fixed this week, yay, um, in the kitchen. And we also got our AC fixed um, in the kids' wing, yay. Um, but when I was talking to the serviceman that Stanley graciously uh, 
offered me and the church. Um, I was talking to him, and the first time he came, he was a little off, and he was a little gruff, and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll be in the office if you need anything, and, um, and then the second time he came, he said, hey, I just want you to know I'm sorry for being a little off the other day. My nephew just died. He was just murdered, and my, uh, some family member just got cancer and diagnosed, and they're on the last days of their life, and then I was on the roof fixing an AC unit and someone got shot right in front of me in my neighborhood. And I was like, wow, like that, that's a lot, brother. And um, I was like, man, and so I just like, man, I'm praying for you, brother. And, and we came in and we talked a little bit about, and he just said, you know, I, I feel like wherever I go, everything is on, everyone is on edge. It's just ready to snap. He's like, I, I don't even feel like I can say hi to anyone anymore because I just feel like someone's going to snap or something. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal out there. The world that we are living in is broken. And I don't know about you, but maybe you feel that burden and maybe you feel that groaning. And in Romans 8, it says this, starting in verse 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, what we just talked about, right? I don't know what suffering you may be experiencing right now or people in your life that are experiencing. But when Paul says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And right there, I mean, some of the suffering that we've gone through, that I've witnessed, that people are still in our body still going through. For Paul to be able to say it's nothing when compared to the glory that will be revealed, this future glory. I mean, it should make us go, whoa, 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 whoa. Because everything in my life, every suffering that I'm going through, when I look on the news, when I look out on my social media feed, wherever I look, suffering is intense right now. There's division, there's strife, there's political ruminations, all this. And yet Paul says all of this doesn't even compare with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. If you've ever thought life was empty and meaningless, like the writer of Ecclesiastes, everything is chasing after a wind. After Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, everything was subjected to futility, thorns and thistles, right? But it says this, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him. God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And some of you might be going, well, I thought I was a child of God right now. You are. There's this thing called, uh, theologians call inaugurated eschatology. In other words, that we're already the sons of God, but we're not yet fully the sons of God. And we're, we're waiting on something else. And that's good news because when you look at the world this today, when you look at our own body and it's deteriorating or wasting away or sick, I hope there's something better than this. And the writer Paul says there is, and we're waiting for that in hope. And so we groan. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you that if you're groaning, if you're burdened, if you're eagerly waiting for something better, then not only you are groaning, but all of creation is groaning, right? Creation itself longs to be set free. And what is this freedom but the freedom of the children of God? And so look at verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And maybe you, like me, sometimes get impatient. Anyone else struggle with patience sometimes? Yeah, all of us, right? When something is not going right, when the world just seems to be falling apart around us, and yet the scripture says to be patient. How can we be patient? In hope, And so you've gathered this morning, probably all of us in somewhere, some level of degree of 
suffering and pain and sin all around us, right? And yet this morning, we have this great hope that we have, that we've come to celebrate at church as we look at Jesus. And so this next few songs that we get to sing together, even though we don't have a band, did you know that the number one fastest growing church in, America, in the world, you know where it is, anyone? Iran. You know where number two is? Afghanistan. The gospel doesn't need buildings and bands to advance. How did the gospel advance in Afghanistan? Because the people who are getting saved in Iran believe Jesus to go make disciple and partner with him to go find more sons and daughters that were lost. And so they, at cost to their own life, went to Afghanistan to preach the gospel. Now they are in danger. You see, the gospel doesn't need a building, doesn't need a band, just needs the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. Because that is what is ultimate. And that is what we are waiting for, church. So I don't know where you've come this morning, but I do know that we can sing, that we can lift up our hands, that we can worship a God who is alive and who has given us a hope that when compared to our current sufferings, far outweighs them all. And that's good news. So as I pray this morning, would you just join me and then let's stand and let's sing. The lyrics will be on the screen behind me. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we were saved with this hope. And boy, does this world need hope. Boy, do we need to bask this morning in the hope of the gospel. And so, Lord, we just come this morning needing you, asking that your Holy Spirit would meet us here. We ask for those that are sick, those that are shut up in their homes, those that are unable to come and be with us this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them. We ask, Lord, that you would meet them wherever they are at, that ultimately, Lord, if they are suffering or they are groaning with all creation, Lord, would you give them an infusion of hope this morning so that they would know you and know your glory and your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This next song you may know, it's um, the, doxo the doxology, but then it goes into a song you may not know, the God of breakthrough, but I believe it's appropriate for us. Would you stand and let us worship this morning?
Above depression, his name is above loneliness. Oh, his name is above disease, his name is above cancer, his name is above every other name. You know, I don't know where you are this morning, but um, I was listening to a podcast this week, and um, it was about a prominent pastor who had um, deconstructed his faith, um, left his pastorate, divorced his wife, and, and then on Instagram announced that he was no longer a Christian. And um, you may know him. He wrote the book, um, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. It was a popular book in the 90s. Um, his name is Josh Harris. And, um, but they were doing a podcast on kind of his journey. And, you know, it was there where the, the host was talking through this idea that several hundred years ago, you may have heard of it as well, it's called the dark night of the soul. And all of us, at some point in our journey, at some point in our relationship with God, we'll get to a place where it seems like God is far away. We don't feel him. We don't know where that he's around and, and it, it gets dark and it gets scary and we feel like he has abandoned us and that he's far from us. And the host said that, you know, for us, the invitation is to trust him even in the midst of the darkness, even in the midst of when we, we cannot see what is happening. And it's actually in that moment where we grow. It's actually in that stage of our faith journey that we actually begin to get some faith muscle and begin to develop stronger and have a rock solid faith that our faith isn't based on just when it feels good, but our faith is in a God who is a way maker, who is a promise keeper, who is a light in the midst of darkness. And so, I, as I said, I don't know where you are coming this morning, but if you are in that place where you feel God is far away, if you feel that God is distant and maybe doubt is creeping in your own heart, maybe you wonder if this thing is real at all, then I would just encourage you because, you know, we're talking over the next few weeks about the prodigal who wanted his inheritance and then squandered it and, and went and lived in wild living and I think ultimately because his hope faded, he began to have doubts, and so he went looking elsewhere. And maybe you've looked elsewhere. Maybe it's looking in the American dream, or maybe it's looking in your family or your job or something, and that just seems to be crumbling all around you. And you're wondering, what is it? Well, the prodigal came to his senses, and he ran to the Father. And so this morning, as we sing this next song, Run to the Father, you may be seated. Go ahead if you want. You may be seated. I'm going to invite you to sing, to stand, to sit, to meditate. It's really up on you. I want, but I want us to respond. And maybe you're like, I'm really close. I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm not in the dark night of the soul. I'm feeling alive in my relationship with Jesus. Then you know what? Maybe this, is, this moment is for you to pray for someone that you know that's far from God and to intercede and stand in the gap for that person that is in that dark night of the soul. Maybe they're questioning the faith. Maybe they've ran away, or maybe they're spending their life on something that doesn't matter in the end. 
and you're like, I'm going to stand in the gap for them, and I'm going to ask that they would come to their senses, that God would awake them, and that they would run to the Father, because he's really the only source of true life and joy and peace and happiness and meaning. And so I just invite you to pray. Spend these next four minutes seeking God, running to the Father who loved us so much, demonstrated his love to us so much that he gave his only son, that he would live the life that we couldn't live and then die the death that we should have died so that we would be reconciled to the Father and have a relationship with the Father. And so in this next song, let's, let's just seek God and ask him to reveal himself. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can run to the Father who is full of compassion, full of grace and mercy, and he has demonstrated this to us over and over and over again. Wherever we are at this morning, I pray that we would understand that we can run to the Father. You never get annoyed. You never feel that we're pestering you. You are infinite in your patience, boundless in your love. And I pray this morning that we would draw near and that you would draw near to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, as I was um, singing that song, I thought of the many times that my son, Caleb or Savannah or one of my five kids, especially when they're younger, they keep running to me and asking me for help. And usually it has something to do with a cell phone, an iPad, a video game system, or some technological gadget. And, um, and there's times where like, okay, but then a while you get like, why am I the tech guy, right? Like, why did God give me the ability to do this? Why does it, ter it's like, ah, and you're like, I need a break. I need a break, you know, and it just wears on you, even though they come and they come and they come and they come and they come. And yet that's not our father in heaven. We can run and come and cry and make our appeals known to him and pray and ask and beg and seek and knock. And here's the good news this morning. Our father in heaven never tires, never grows old, never is wearied of our asking or our petitioning. He is always there. And so we should run to the father. Whatever the need is, whatever the burden, whatever the ache, whatever the groaning, go to him and ask him to reveal his love and give you a peace that surpasses understanding. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. We're going to spend the next three weeks in this famous chapter in Luke's Gospel. Um, and really, what we see here is Jesus telling three parables, two short parables and then a longer parable. And most of us are familiar with the longer one. It's the parable of the lost son or what some have just called the parable of the prodigal son. And we're going to talk about the first two this morning. Then we're going to spend two weeks on the parable of the prodigal son. And we're going to look at the two brothers because really what we need to see this morning is that, or in the next two weeks, but in that particular parable, it wasn't just the younger son who was in trouble. It was actually the older one who had the bigger issue. And so God has come to seek and save the irreligious and the religious because both are lost without Jesus. And so, but it's interesting because so many dig right into the context of the prodigal son and, you know, maybe you've known someone or maybe you yourself have been that prodigal in church language that has, you know, spent years of wild living. And, you know, if you know the story of the prodigal, he spent his father's inheritance on prostitutes and licentious living, and he ended up finding himself in some pig slop. And he came to his senses and he ran home. And so for many of us, when we think of this, this chapter, we think of that parable. But it's interesting that Jesus has a context um, for telling us that story. And that's where we pick it up this morning in verse 1. And if we don't understand the context by which Jesus tells us these three parables, then we're going to lose out on really what the meaning is behind the story of the prodigal or the lost son. So at Vintage Church, we stand 
uh, for the reading of God's Word. And so if you're able and you're willing to honor the Word of God this morning, the Scripture that God has breathed and given us for our encouragement, our edification, our empowerment to live out our the mission of God in everyday life, would you please stand as we read verses 1 through 7, I'm sorry, 1 through 10 this morning. Starting in verse 1, the Scripture says this, Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Jesus better. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may understand the truth and apply it to our lives. And Holy Spirit, we need you to come and fill us up this morning so that we can become more and more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, Let me ask you a question this morning. Is there something in your life that if you lost it, you would spend everything that you had You would be prodigal. Remember, one of the definitions of the word prodigal is to spend everything and almost go reckless. I'll do anything. I'll not eat, not sleep. I'll do everything to find this one thing. I'll break the bank. I will go prodigal to just find this one thing. For me, maybe for you, if you're a parent, it would be your child or maybe a spouse and uh, I sent an email this week, but I, I recounted a story where uh, several years ago we were at Disneyland with my wife's extended family, and um, it's a big crew, probably 43 people of us, um, all of Tara's um, siblings and their kids and grandkids. It's just a huge group of us. We're all at Disneyland and California Adventure, and I think we had broken up because the the ride requirements were such that Savannah couldn't ride, so we were walking around Cars Land and California Adventure, um, just t- um, Savannah and I, and um, Savannah had this habit of just kind of staying behind, and, and, and so I would walk a few steps and then like look behind me and say, Savannah, come on, let's go, come on, and um, well, that happened a few times, and it was packed, and so we uh, were walking through this crowd, and then all of a sudden I look back to look for Savannah, and she's not there, and so I start to look, and Savannah, Savannah, and I'm looking everywhere. No Savannah. Starting to freak out. Big crowd, can't find her. I'm like pacing frantically, looking everywhere, looking, Savannah, we're nowhere to be found. Biggest call, right? Tara, (laughs) honey, Savannah's gone. She's gone. What do you mean she's gone? She was behind me. She's gone. So we start to talk to workers. And my wife said that when she was talking to the workers, they were just about ready to shut the gates at California Adventureland to make sure that if someone had snagged her, that they would shut the gates and check everyone that going through the gates. And at that moment, my phone rings and it's a worker. Hi, are you Timothy Stewart? Yes. I have your daughter, Savannah, with me. Okay, where are you at? And we go find her. Everyone's relieved. And praise the Lord, my niece had the sense earlier in the day to take a Sharpie pen and write on all of the children's arms cell phone numbers. So 
Savannah had my cell phone number on her arm in Sharpie. And so when she got lost, she went and found a worker. The worker looked at the arm, called my cell phone. What happened? Savannah saw another bald man and chased him. That's what happened. I said, Savannah, what happened? She says, I just saw this bald guy and I started following him. And she got lost. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. But we, we were relieved. We rejoiced. It was a good day because what was lost was found. And I mean, California, they were going to shut the gates. Everyone was looking. We were spending so much energy just to find this one lost daughter. But when something's lost of value, we go after it with everything that we can, right? And this is interesting because Jesus is actually doing something that's drawing the grumbling and complaining of the Pharisees and the scribes. And we've talked about this many times, but the Pharisees and the scribes were the religious leaders of the day. They were the religious. They were the pastors, the teachers, the Sunday school teachers, the deacons, the elders, the ministry directors, the children's workers. They were the faithful attenders every Sunday. They were the professional go get them religious people of the day and Jesus is eating with them and they are grumbling about Jesus complaining why because look at verse 1 now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him so you may not have fond feelings for IRS agents but I promise you the Jews hated tax collectors they, la they um, labeled them on the same level as prostitutes, sinners, and even shepherds. Shepherds were seen as dirty and unclean because they could not go on Sabbath because they were tending their flock. And so they were all in this lower class, this lower social class of tax collectors and sinners. Really, the tax collectors were scamming their own people to make a buck and serve the oppressive government of the Romans. They were hated by their fellow kinsmen, their fellow Jews. And yet something about Jesus, and I think this is where we really need to think about this. There was something about Jesus that they were coming to him. They were listening to him. They wanted to hear what he was saying. And they weren't coming and hearing what the Pharisees and the scribes were saying. So I think there was some jealousy going on here. There was some, why are these people talking? But then there was also this separation that they thought, I am holy by separating myself from those who are unclean or who are not like me. And yet, let's just have a frank conversation this morning, church. How many people that you, we would describe in our current day as tax collectors and sinners are running to you and asking you and hanging on every word of you as a church, the church in general? Because most people, when they think of the church, they think of the church as what? Let's have some interaction this morning. When they think of the church, when your friends who don't go to church, when they think about the church, how do they describe Christians or the church? Judgmental, hypocrites, greedy, want money, right? Now, and that's not true everywhere, but generally speaking, we probably more fall in the line of the Pharisees and the scribes than Jesus. And so it's into that context, into that situation, Jesus tells these parables. And so I would just ask all of us collectively this morning to identify ourselves, because there's a stark contrast this morning between the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus. And it's in this context, it's in this situation that Jesus tells these parables. It's right there in verse to, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives or welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. Jesus even had a reputation that he was a drunkard and a glutton. Why? Because he was eating with sinners all the time. He was feasting with sinners all the time. 
And yet the Pharisees saw themselves to be holy by separating themselves from tax collectors and sinners. They didn't want to get any of their stank on them. And yet, if we were to examine our own life, how many of us are, have friends that are non-Christians? Because as a pastor who's been in professional ministry for almost 20 years now, most of my friends for a while were Christians, people that I did ministry with. Because we get um, in this little bubble of church and Christianity, and that becomes our social group. And we don't have friends that are non-Christians. And yet, oftentimes, what we, when we look at Jesus, he is with the tax collectors. He's with the sinners. I don't know why you may or may not have non-Christian friends, or why they're not coming to you to hear about Jesus and this gospel, this hope that we have. Because if anything, church, right now the world is looking for hope. The world is looking for something because everything that they put their hope in, everything that they put their security and confidence in, it's crumbling before their eyes. Politics, education, science, the secular pursuit of happiness and hedonism, everything is crumbling around them and they are looking for something that lasts and church if we really believe the gospel this morning we actually have the one thing that has meaning and lasts forever so i would hope that our hearts long for the lost to draw near to us and we would be able to share with them let me ask this question why why do we not evangelize? Why do we not, why, or maybe why are we so hesitant to share the gospel or have non-Christian friends and share with them about the hope that we profess? Rejection, being mocked, ridiculed, persecuted, being seen as that crazy Jesus freak, right? And yet, Jesus says this to us this morning. So he told them this parable. And really, in verse 3, you have to see, so he told them. That word so indicates this is the reason why. So the context really matters in the first couple verses. So he told them this parable. So if you find yourself more inclined to Christians than non-Christians, or maybe you find yourself showing contempt and grumbling when, when you know, those sinners come into church, because oftentimes, how, how many of you guys have been in a church environment where, you know, everyone is in their suit and everyone is in their Sunday best, and then that one person comes in all tattooed up and maybe a little hungover, and they're like, you're like, what is that guy doing in here? I'm sitting over here, and everyone's whispering and grumbling or, you know, I mean, that never happens in churches, right? Never? I remember hearing a story of a, um, of a father who his son had started to become more and more passionate about Jesus. And so as a father, he thought, man, I, um, I need to go investigate what church this, my son's going to. And um, so he went, and it was this dark theater-type place with candles everywhere. And the guy who was given the announcements had tattoos everywhere and awls in his ears and um, looked kind of goth. And in his heart, he was judging the man and thought, man, who is this guy? Man, he needs Jesus. And um, then at the end of the service, they were doing communion. And that man grabbed his family, his children and his wife, gathered them around over the bread and cup and was praying for them passionately and asking the Lord to show him grace. And, And he just thought in that moment, I am like the Pharisees. I was so judgmental about this person. And yet his heart is clearly for Jesus. And he is shaming me as he's loving and praying for and serving his family over communion. And oftentimes we're so quick to grumble. We're so quick to judge. We're so quick. And so Jesus tells us this story. He says in verse 3, So he told them this parable, What man of you, 
having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Now, I know many of us, we've seen the artwork, we've heard the poems, or we've heard of this parable that Jesus thankfully leaves the ninety-nine and goes find the one. But again, why did Jesus tell this parable? Not so that you would feel good about yourself that Jesus came and found you. Although that's true, who's thankful this morning that Jesus left the 99 and came and found us when we were the one? I am so e eternally grateful. But that's not why Jesus told us this parable. He told us this parable because the Pharisees and the scribes were more inclined to sit there in their self-righteousness and contempt of sinners and tax collectors instead of going and eating with the very people who needed Jesus the most. And also didn't realize that they needed Jesus too, but they were stuck in their pride and their self-righteous and religion. And so he says, how many of you wouldn't leave the 99? And it's so, I love how Jesus does this because the two small parables that we're going to go over today, he's talking about a shepherd and a woman. In their culture, how did they view shepherds? I already sh shared with you the answer. As a tax collector, as a sinner, they were the lowest class in the Jewish system. And women were not able to even ask questions in church, or they couldn't even speak. They were seen very low as well. And so Jesus, I love this, he's the revolutionary, right? He tells them about a shepherd and about a woman. Because he's flipping the inverted order here. And so he says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And, and this is where you have to kind of read between the lines. There are no 99 righteous people that don't need repentance. He's jabbing at the Pharisees and the scribes because they are so blind to think that they don't need help. They actually believe because they have the law, because they do these ritual, uh, religious rituals, they don't need Jesus. They don't need a Savior. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But Jesus is getting to their very heart, and he's saying, you need, you absolutely need him. But the most clear indicator that you need Jesus is that your hearts are dull and dumb to the fact that when there's a lost person around you, you're clueless. But the heart of the shepherd goes after the lost one until he finds it. So Jesus is saying, listen, no wonder, if you read between the lines, no wonder I eat with sinners. No wonder I eat with tax collectors. No wonder, because I want them to find Jesus. I want them to find a Savior. I want them to find salvation. Earlier in the gospel, he says, the sick, the, the well don't need a doctor. Who needs the doctor? The sick right? And so we must see this this morning, that if we find ourselves not prone to living a life where we are mindful of the non-Christians or those that are lost, and they may even conclude that they are Christians in their own mind. They may go to church. Can there be lost people in church? Yes. Can there be lost people in our neighborhood? Yes. They may seem like everything is going well in their life, but they may be lost. And in Luke 19.10, Jesus says that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Meaning, the only way that we can join Jesus on mission is if we are seeking to save that which is lost. We join Jesus on mission. And he didn't just do it 2,000 years ago. Today, Jesus is seeking and saving those who are lost. That's really good news. Because if you know a husband or a wife or a child, or a grandchild, or a niece, or a nephew, or a neighbor, or a co-worker who is lost and is far from God. Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they go to church occasionally on Easter and Christmas, but they are far from God, and they are lost. 
Jesus is still in the business of seeking and saving them and pursuing them, that they would come home. And we are, can either be over here in the corner doing our religious stuff, or we can join Jesus in seeking and saving those who are lost. And you may ask the question, well, pastor, how, how do I do that? Number one, we pray. And number two, we eat. And number three, we pursue them. We ask questions. And we know that ultimately at the end of the day, it's not all on us. We're just the mailman delivering the message. It does not depend on us. You cannot save your son or your daughter. You cannot save your coworker. You cannot save your neighbor. Only Jesus saves, but we serve. We serve those by praying for them, listening to them. And if they come to us, I, I, I saw this was great. Like whether it's trauma in their life or transition in their life, or they're just tired in their life, and there's something in their life that's unrestful. It usually presents us an opportunity to share the gospel, or at least pray for them and serve them. But if we're never having the mind to see them as lost, and that we're joining Jesus on mission, then we'll never see the opportunities. We must always be listening to Jesus, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, so that we can know where he's at where he's pursuing the lost, because he's still pursuing the lost today. We're not bringing Jesus out there. We have to believe this morning that Jesus is already out there in Lodi. Do you believe that this morning? That he's behind the scenes working. He's behind the scenes pursuing the lost. He's out there seeking and saving. And as a church, his kids about our father's business we have to go find where Jesus is already at work and join him and pray and serve and share the gospel. That's what we do. But first, we have to check our own hearts. Are we more like the Pharisees who sit back and watch and grumble because it might be more effort? Because let's just be honest, are, are, are non-Christians and new believers a lot of work? They're messy, right? They, they I mean, newborns are messy, right? Who's ever had a newborn? changing all those diapers, getting up at night, all, right? And sometimes that new believer is going to, or that non-Christian is going to have all these questions. And it's going to be like, um, what about evolution? What about this? What about this? What about this? And I don't know about this. I can't agree with that. Or I, I'm still stuck in this sin. I'm still addicted to this. And you're like, oh, again, little baby, newborn. Maybe the Pharisees and the scribes were so content in their own comfortability of their religion that they lost the fact that the mission was always to find the one. And that's what Jesus is rebuking them in this parable. And he goes on to another parable. But another thing that we have to pay attention to in verse 7, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There's more joy in heaven. You see, do you rejoice when one repents, when one comes home? If you don't, you're probably over here doing your own thing in your little religious bubble, watching, grumbling, and complaining. But if you're joining Jesus on mission, though it can be rough at times, your heart is aligned with him, and you rejoice when someone comes. When someone comes and finds Jesus for the first time, your heart bursts because you know that in heaven, the angels are throwing a party for that one that repented, that one who saw their need for Jesus and came to faith, that, that transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, that went from sinner to saint, that went from lost son or son of the devil to son of God or daughter of the devil to daughter of God. You're like, what do you mean daughter of the devil? Read Ephesians 2. All of us who are outside of Christ, we are children of wrath. I'm sorry, we have to come to grips with this this morning. If your loved one is not in Christ, they are far from God. They are in peril. And I know we don't like to have that conversation. But they are in peril. And you have the answer. And you're like, well, I thought it doesn't depend on me. It doesn't. But are you praying for them? Are you serving them? Are you sharing the gospel with them? Are you looking for opportunities? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit to tell you what to do and when to do it? Are you burdened with them? Because for Jesus right now, he's saying, listen, Pharisees, scribes, you don't get it. 
Are you burdened about the one who is lost? My whole mission is here to seek and to save those who are lost. Are you burdened? And he gives them another parable. Verse 8, Or what woman having ten silver coins? Now, this silver coins isn't just like, you know, I had ten quarters. This ten silver coins was um, like a wedding ring. These silver coins actually were um, what we would call a wedding ring. And, and to lose one of these coins would to be to bring great disgrace and shame on that woman. I remember one time we were at an In-N-Out um, company picnic for four years from 16 to 20. I worked for In-N-Out. That's why I love In-N-Out Burger so much. They're a great company. They took us on a private jet. They flew us down to LA for a picnic. And then the next year they flew us or they drove us to Manteca when they had the water slides there. And I remember we were doing the whole water slide thing and um, we were getting ready to go. And my wife looked around and she's like, where's my ring? Where's my ring? Oh, wow. We were frantic. We had just got married. We got married at 19. So we were looking frantically for this ring that I had just spent a lot of money on. And so I'm looking everywhere. We're going on the, we're asking the staff. We're going on the water slides. We're looking in the pool. We're looking on the grass. We're looking on a picnic blanket everywhere. And guess what? No ring. So we had to just say, oh, well, I hope someone finds it. We go back to Elk Grove, in and out, get a phone call. Hey, someone saw your ring and brought it. Oh, thank you. It was at the in and out store. We were so relieved. We like called everybody. We texted everybody. We're so thankful because we did not want to lose our, my wife's wedding ring. And so this is the imagery here. It's not just a coin. It's not just 10 quarters. This is her wedding ring that she's looking for. And what does she do? If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp. Because back then, houses were dark. They didn't have electricity. They swept the house. They seek diligently. This looks like me looking for my keys or the remote controller. Anyone do that? When they're like trying to find the remote controller and it gets in the cracks and they're like flipping over, you know, cushions and all that, trying to find the remote control or your keys or, or money that you lost or something. They're flipping up everything, trying to find it. And when she has found it, what does she do? She calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is joy in heaven. Do you want to pursue joy? And if you do, then we must pursue the lost. That's the simple message this morning. And so I want to conclude with two quotes, one from uh, D.L. Moody and one from Charles Spurgeon. Um, when D.L. Moody was directing Sunday school in Chicago, um, there was a boy that would walk several miles to attend the Sunday school. Uh, reminded me of you, Nancy. And somebody asked him, why don't you go to a Sunday school closer to home? So this guy's walking this long journey just to go to this one Sunday school led by D.L. Moody. And his reply um, may have been used the same as the publicans or the tax collectors and the sinners in this story we just read. This is what the little boy said, because they love a feller over there. They love him. Can you tell the difference when you walk in a place in your love? and you're welcome versus somewhere where you feel off. Lord, help us be a church where we love fellers, right? Where we love little boys and little girls and big boys and big girls, where we love adults and children and students, and we let them know that Jesus welcomed us when we were far from God, so we welcome them. Lord, help us live out this grace. And then this one's a little bit more stinging, but Charles Spurgeon, who is known as the Prince of Preachers, he said this, every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Recollect that you are either trying to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. Of course, I do not mean by that that those who use the pen for Christ are silent. They are not. And those who help others to use this tongue or spread that which others have written are doing their part well. But I mean this, that man 
who says, I believe in Jesus, but does not think enough of Jesus ever to tell another about him by mouth or pen or tract is an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. How do we know this? Because that what we taste and see is good, we tell others about. So maybe this morning, you've never truly tasted and seen that God is good. You've never really believed and experienced the joy of the gospel. So you wouldn't go share that with anyone else because you have your own doubts. And maybe you're not an imposter this morning, but maybe you're just immature and you need to be developed and you need to grow up and be encouraged and equipped. But the truth is, church, we can either choose to be with Jesus on mission or we can choose to be like the Pharisees and the scribes who grumbled and complained and watched Jesus do the work because Jesus' heart was for the lost. And that's why he told us to go find the one, even leave the 99. That might mean that we are more concerned about those out there than those in here at times. Because our heart is for those who are lost, sons and daughters. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And I know for, for some of us, um, being a quote-unquote missionary, we think of those who go overseas and spend their life reaching unreached people groups in jungles and Afghanistan and Iran. But Jesus, you ask us not to just be missionaries across the seas, but across the street in our everyday life to join you seeking and saving those who are lost. And maybe we're not the most eloquent or we don't know all of the answers, but we can pray, we can serve, we can encourage, we can bring them to Alpha, we can invite them over for coffee, we can love them and serve them and, and be there when they need us the most and show them the hope of Jesus in the world. And so I just pray this morning that you would stir in us a heart to evangelize, to share the gospel, to seek after the lost, to join you, Jesus, in mission. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to leave you this morning with a benediction. Just continuing in 1 Corinthians. You can stay standing. Or if, even if you're seated, that's okay. But I want to leave us with a benediction or a blessing to carry this morning as we go into our everyday lives. This is the words of Paul. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Anyone agree with that one? Not many were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Yeah, that's me. Not many were of noble birth. Yep. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So as you go this morning, boast in the Lord, who did the heavy lifting, and let's join him and seek and save those who are lost in our life. Let's eat more with tax collectors and sinners. If you know an IRS, an IRS agent, invite him over for dinner. Just kidding. But um, have a, a, a blessed rest of your Sunday and week. Uh, we'll be over in the fellowship hall in just a few minutes. I believe we have some snacks and refreshments. Love to get to know you, meet you, pray for you if you need prayer. But we'll be doing that in the fellowship hall. But if anyone's interested, um, five minutes is all I really need to answer any questions, to kind of give an overview of Alpha. But just stick around in five minutes. I'll give you five minute spiel and answer any questions. Then we'll see each other in the fellowship hall. But with that, be dismissed. Have a blessed rest of your week.